Scott Warner, the CEO of Inhibicase. Uh, Inhibicase has developed the first small molecule strategy capable of treating bacterial and viral infectious disease with a single agent in an oral form. The company's strategy treats the patient, not the pathogen, and as such does not stimulate resistance, the leading reason why infectious disease agents fail in the marketplace. Our virtual business model will go to market for an orphan drug indication known as PML, a fatal brain disorder, and with that market, we can reach it in five years for under $7 million investment with a total addressable market of $400 million. The revenues from that rapid, cash-efficient market will allow us to develop an even greater asset for flu antiviral, which, as many of you know, is now fully resistant in the marketplace and has more than 100 million patients accessible. The company's management is trained in both big pharma and big biotech and has a combined experience of more than 40 years in drug development and commercialization. The company seeks $30 million to reach the break-even point, creating multiple opportunities for liquidity and return on investment for our investors. That was a three-floor. That's right. <laughs> a little bit of <laughs> yeah. That's great. Leave, leave us wanting more. That's, yeah, a good, yeah. that's actually a very good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, a question, since we do have 12 more floors to go in the elevator, yeah. uh, uh, is, uh, you well, know. It gives us time to talk, right? Exactly. No, I'm interested. You got me in. You, yeah. you actually won me over. Uh, what, uh, you know, the, you've obviously gotten this before. That, hey, it's too good to be true. Uh, you know, how, wh where did this come from and how, you know, well, how did this so come about? No, most people who have tried to treat infectious disease have tried to treat the pathogen. It always leads to resistance because you select for all the resistant organisms already present in everybody or in the population at large. So why do we win if we're right? Well, what we did is understand what the mechanism of action was for how pathogens and viruses get inside human cells. Once those pathways were identified, we could readily show that those pathways are used by multiple infectious agents, whether bacterial or viral. And when we knew the pathways inside human cells, we already had been able to identify clinically validated targets, could use repurposed products to hit those targets with multi-year safety history. So all I have to do to go to market is show that what I know to be true in animals against those targets that are safe to be targeted in people is to just prove that it treats an infectious disease. We went after a low-hanging fruit, something that causes fatality in the orphan drug, compassionate use setting, to prove it. Once we prove it once, I win every single time because I can reuse that same product to treat that same target and pathway for every infectious agent that uses it. I know I've seen preclinical efficacy for eight different pathogens, four bacterial, four viral. We know mechanism of action for four of those agents. Uh, and four of them have very large markets, as I'll show. The fact that your technology is inhibiting a human pathway, is there a downside to if inhibiting a human pathway that has evolved to protect us stops? Uh, normally that's true, but the targets <laughs> in this case have actually are, are involved in signaling pathways that the cell can live without. It has redundancies, and those redundancies are used by the pathogens to get in. So one added advantage for us is that since the targets are known and the products have been shown to be safe for that targeting, they don't need to be very specific, and therefore our burden for development is lower. We know we can inhibit those pathways without harming people because we have multi-year safety history already in the clinic for the, cl the original clinical use for the repurposed products. Mm -hmm. Plus, we're developing an NC portfolio as follow-ons because we all know that something could go wrong or we're just going to be out-competed in the marketplace with the original developers. So we have behind it a very rich NC portfolio to hit those same targets and pathways in a second step. So yes, it does sound pie in the sky. It just turns out that we have a solid shot here. Yeah. No, it's, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> That's why I'm very happy to see you here today. <laughs> and by the way, I hear you're looking for a job. <laughs> In Charlotte. I'm shameless. I'm, so, I, I'm coming to North Carolina, so it's okay with me. Well, I want to thank the staff and, uh, uh, of BSK. I'm Milton Werner. Um, I appreciate you taking time to evaluate uh, a targeting, uh, excuse me, an uh, infectious disease opportunity for partnering with BSK that I think could significantly impact and positively help your business. As many of you know, common infections are becoming a major human health concern. As reported in the New York Times just at the beginning of this year, the leading flu antiviral compound, something that upwards of 100 million people could take, is now 100 percent resistant. What I'm going to tell you today is how to create one drug to treat multiple common infections without the engendering of resistance through traditional mechanisms. 
Our development program will combine a repurposing effort with a portfolio of NCEs behind it and strong intellectual property so we can build a business that constantly moves forward, not just keeps reinventing the same product to overcome the resistance profile. Milton, before you go, and would you tell mm -hmm. us about the common diseases that we're talking about so we can get an idea of the Flu, market? TB, HCV, um, pox viruses is on a biodefense indication, pathogenic E. coli, pneumonia. Uh, we think we're going to be able to bring our first product to market in under five years for just $7 million of total outside investment. Now, what's the typical product life cycle for infectious disease? This is really seen here in the green curve. Cipro, a widely understood and known antibiotic, it had a 400% increase in sales over an eight-year period, and then the market crashed. And that happens time and time again in the infectious disease business, making it very challenging about how you're going to develop a product. It happens because once you hit about 25% resistance in the population, your product is dead. Inhibicase has a completely different strategy to overcome this. So how does it work? Well, typically what happens is the pathogen, that purple circle, engages a receptor on a human cell, shown in gray, enters the cell with its gen genetic and structural material and follows along a sort of cellular superhighway for maturation and exit. A typical drug blocks a pathogen. So those little blue circles engage the receptor docking site and the pathogen no longer gets in. But that's just one of many similar viruses or bacteria that are already there. So all we do is enhance the population of the resistant bacteria, and so the one with a slightly different receptor entry point, that blue square, gets in and now causes the problem and product collapse. Uh, uh, just be before you go on, mm -hmm. um, j just so, you, just so you, you know and m maybe you can change your pitch to take account of it, we actually have, I don't know, I've lost count, 20 uh, human targets uh, being investigated as antibacterials. In other words, the idea of going after uh, human targets not new. We just don't have a lot of drugs on the market yet. So we actually have a lot more information about this field than than, we, than maybe you know. Um, and so that doesn't mean we're not interested. It's just that it's not a new concept for us. And um, I think of everything you said so far on these slides, the the the, the most incredible actually is the seven million dollars to get to the marketplace. Because uh, you know I, I can't even I can't even put together a, an NDA for seven million dollars. Uh, so I, I'm I'm. Uh, Th that number actually um, makes me more incredulous than the, than the science you're talking about. So uh, uh, I could I, justify that. Piece. Yeah, no, I would like to hear a little bit and, and put it in the context of, because you're not the only person in the world that's, that's talked about going after a, hu a, a human target um, uh, for, for the, bacterials. The major differentiating factor between what we're doing and right. what's been tried in the host targeting area is that most people are trying to identify targets yeah, that they exactly. can safely and systemically treat. Right. I know how bacteria, several bacteria and viruses get into or mature inside cells. With that knowledge, I already had clinically identified targets that are validated, meaning right. I can give systemic treatments and do it. And with our product strategy to go after a low-hanging fruit on a highly protected pathway for, as an orphan drug for a fatal disorder, I have to run one trial, 40 people, and I go to market. Yeah, yeah. At least go according to, to the regulatory analysis to we've done day. with the FDA. So yeah, exactly. That's subject to... Uh, of course it is. To ...whether Congressman Grassley called up the FDA head uh, in the last week or not. There, there's no question that the, while all we can do is pro project what our regulatory pathway is going to look like, right. we've had this done in detail by SAFA Solutions, a group out of Lilly that's had three approval letters turned to approvals for Lilly without new data, and it's quite clear that we have everything in place for our INDs, there's no animal models that we have to prove for efficacy. We can show that in preclinical models, just cell-based. We know they have the antiviral activity, and we know mechanism of action. We walk through that process, and all we have to do is run an efficacy trial, and it's fairly clear we'll get a combined phase two, three, or just a phase three trial to market. That's well, uh, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll, we'll obviously be interested in looking at that. You know, PML is uh, because of some of the dr new drugs in the marketplace in in MS and mm -hmm. some other areas, it, there's m a little bit more of it than it used to be, but it's not like there's a PML treatment center somewhere, so you have to go find patients one at a time almost by watching the news reports. Actually, we have a way of dealing with that. Okay. Um, the way we deal with that with PML is that the, uh, presently 5% of AIDS patients globally uh, get PML and die, 90% uh, fatality. The AIDS Clinical Trial Network is a highly established network of patients who are already compliant with a uniform well, background. They're, they're getting PML as a consequence of a lot of other issues. That's so, correct. Um, but it's the only way you could run a trial for... No, I understand, but it's, uh, 
anyway, uh, we'll look into it, but the, the, the simplicity of the clinical trial, I mean, I wouldn't mind if you said it'll, it'll cost $150 million to get to the first, the first NDA. I would, you know, I would actually wouldn't be asking these questions. I'd I still understand. be just as interested. <laughs> All right, so just to give you a, fairer, a, a better picture on how the, how the technology works, we have two classes of, of products symbolized by IKT-01 and IKT-041. Both have multi-year safety history in humans against clinically validated targets. The 001 class interferes with the ability of a pathogen to recognize a receptor at a cell surface by downregulating those receptors. Or it also has an influence on the ability of a bacterium or virus once mature to exit the cell. The IKT-041 class blocks that cellular superhighway required for maturation. Both have a, a clear intellectual property pathway for us. We have multiple applications for methods of use, and behind them, as I'll explain, we have composition for matter control. So what, while we, what we do is we block pathways in people that both bacteria and viruses require, and as a consequence, we don't stimulate traditional resistance mechanisms. We can't predict that every mechanism will be unknown, that, that will be blocked, but certainly all those that are known would not be stimulated by this process. So how well does it work? Here's a typical example in a mouse cohort, the green line on the left, you see a pretreatment with IKT-001 and 100% survival of the mice showing the therapeutic outcome against the lethal infection of a virus. On the right, what we've done is taken that same cohort from the left, withdrawn the drug for six weeks, re-inoculated them with a lethal infection, and they're completely protected. So we get a therapeutic effect and a vaccine response in many cases. So our development strategy is to go against low-hanging fruit to reach a phase three completion by the end of 2012 on, both, on two polyomoviral indications, both PML, which has a, an addressable market of roughly $400 million, and for kidney transplant patients, a viral, a viral outcome of nephropathy, a failure of the kidney graft to take because under immunosuppressive treatments. I'm kind of surprised by that vaccine effect. Uh, can you just walk me through why, why one should expect that? Yes. So when you treat the, the way this strategy works is by dramatically lowering the efficiency of reproduction or replication of the bacterial or virus inside a human cell. It doesn't eliminate it. That gives a sufficient amount of time for the immune system to build up an immune response to it. We've seen that for pox, for E. coli, for pseudomonas thus far. So we know that we can have an an adaptive immune response as an outcome of this treatment because we don't eliminate the virus by treating it, we lower its efficiency of replication dramatically. So the question you may anticipate is what happens in an immunosuppressed person? An immunosuppressed person does not have an, a non-functioning immune system. They have one that's just downregulated. Well, your PML patients may be, may, may be that way, but. Well, um, we, there's a, that's a, yeah. that is definitely an unknown. Yeah. So, Behind this uh, repurposing effort with two repurposes drugs on two different classes, um, we also have an NCE portfolio that we're going to be pursuing for our follow-on products for flu and polyomal uh, uh, indications, as well as for additional indications going forward. HCV, pneumonia, and RSV are our top three candidates. We're able to do this without spending money because we can take all of our NCEs, go to the NIAID, and go through their antiviral screening program because we've picked priority organisms of the government, which means they'll pay for all of the preclinical and preclinical efficacy studies before I ever have to spend a dollar. That means I don't need a lab to understand what my follow-on products could look like. Our NCEs might already be optimized leads, but I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that many of them have multiple pathogen ef efficacy in cell culture. So our market and commercialization strategy, the thing that may be most attractive to BSK, of course, is that polyoma viral indications are affecting many people's products, both BSK and many of its competitors who are creating dis uh, drugs for autoimmune disorders, and those drugs are inducing EPML in those patients. What we offer to BSK is the opportunity now to have something that treats both that primary infection that they've created and take our product as a protectant against the formation of a fatal disorder. That's going to push BSK's products in the autoimmune space at the front of the line in every indication. Plus. BSK could also choose to just sell that drug independently, not just in combination with its own products, and therefore it also captures a piece of every one of its competitors' marketplace. That's true for PML. It'll also be true for the influenza, both seasonal and prophylactic indications. And prophylactic is required because of this 100, 100 uh, million patient exposure that exists because of the loss of Tamiflu from the marketplace. Now, what's our revenue model look like? Well, we've set up everything to be very cash efficient and virtual. We think our investments and our costs will align with our revenues and keep them relatively flat in the first three years. But as we grow our investments and revenues, we'll outpace our costs of development. 
allowing us to get either cash positive or break, break, break even in just five years with substantial returns that can fund our follow-on programs. And that's the objective, be cash efficient to achieve those goals. So we require just equity investments of $5 million to 2011, $30 million to the break-even point. I think that is an unheard of metric in our industry. Our, our, uh, what, what's your, um, so in your contemplated partnership with us, what's, what, what's the effect on that model? That, was a mo that model was assuming what kind of partnerships? That model assumes that we would take in equity investments from any source, equity and non-equity investments from any source to be able to pay for the costs and go to market. In partnership with you, you would give us, you would pay for our development costs, and we obviously go into a revenue sharing model for these products going forward to enhance your business and allow so me that's to- So your, that's not your model in the, in the contemplated partnership? That's correct. Uh, we have to be able to have a standalone business model if we're gonna survive. If you partner no, with I, us, I, we're gonna I, get there sooner. I get that, I, I support that. Uh, we, want our, we want our partners to survive. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so that, but I was just trying to figure out that model wasn't your partnership P&L that's correct. Uh, projection. Okay. Right. The money can come from anywhere. If it comes from you, all the better. Well, we're not interested in making just passive investments. Uh, That's right. Otherwise, we'd buy chocolate chip cookie companies. Right. Now, talk to me about the intellectual property and what you what the period is left. Potentially. Uh, a lot. So okay. we have ten uh, issued and uh, prosecuting patents. Mm -hmm. um, the filing date, the nationalization dates for s for nine of those ten patents just occurred this year. Okay. So we've got a lot of years of runway in front of us. We're now developing an intellectual property strategy to cover formulations, combination products of any type, every other agent that we find to work to protect our methods of use control on the repurposed products and as well as for our NCE portfolio. So just to give you a flavor of what our management team is like, you can see their credentials um, already on the screen. Just so you know what an entrepreneur like me has done in the past, I joined a company a few years ago took it from the loss of its technology license to a $20 million pre-money valuation in under 12 months, which was a pretty rapid s recovery of that company. Our management team has multiple years of experience in both drug development and in commercialization and sales. We are looking at every aspect of that as we go forward. So finally, what is the partnering opportunity? Well, we know that BSK is significantly invested in infectious disease. We offer multiple solutions for multiple indications in its disease portfolio that can align with and augment its pipeline. We encourage scientific due diligence immediately. We're ready to show you that data under confidentiality so that we can come on site and demonstrate how we could augment BSK's business model and create a new strategy for it to go forward with, something that will outpace its competitors. And finally, we are already built as a company intending to take its products to market if we have to. I think that's challenging, but that's what we're gonna try to and do. Presumably, to. you're willing to enter into a two-way CDA so we can tell you things as well that might actually Surprise you? Absolutely. Okay. If I'm not willing to learn from the people I want to interact with, then I'm not going to learn much at all. Right. We won't make it.